Hello and welcome to this webinar on Canada and the Korean War, a forgotten ally and a forgotten war, an event organized by the Wilson Center's Canada Institute and its history and public policy program in collaboration with the Asia program. My name is Charles Krauss and I am the Deputy Director of the History and Public Policy Program, and I am delighted to host and moderate the discussion today. For those of you who know the Wilson Center well, you are probably aware of our past explorations of the Korean War. Going back to the early 1990s, we have published hundreds of archival documents and almost just as many scholarly analyses of communist bloc alliance dynamics during the Korean War and the interactions between Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and Kim Il-sung in the lead up to June 25th, 1950. Many of our key research findings were re recently featured in the June 2020 issue of the Wilson Quarterly, uh, which I encourage all of you to consult online. Today, uh, we are examining the Korean War from an entirely different perspective in the and in the context of a different alliance compared to our past work, that of Canada and its relationship with the United States and the United Nations. Canadian armed, Canadian armed Forces fought in the Korean War alongside soldiers from the United States and other UN member states, helping to protect the Republic of Korea or South Korea from repeated North Korean and Chinese encroachments south of the 38th parallel. In fact, 70 years ago this month, Canadian soldiers with the Uni uh, United Nations Command fought in the Battle of Kapyong, a significant, a significant engagement during what we now call the Chinese Spring Offensive of the Korean War. Kapyong is one of the most well-remembered battles that Canadian soldiers participated in, though certainly not the only, and it serves as the point of departure for our panel today. In total, roughly 30,000 Canadian soldiers served in the Korean War. These Canadian forces bravely fought in several key battles and engagements, provided naval and aerial support to the UN command, and suffered hundreds of combat casualties. Although often overlooked or forgotten, uh, at least in the United States, the Korean War is a key chapter in the US-Canada relationship, in Canada's modern military history, and in the record of Canada's engagement with multilateral and collective security institutions. So to mark the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Kapyong and to reflect upon the larger history of Canadian involvement in the Korean War, we have called upon three leading specialists of Canada's diplomatic and military history, Jack Cunningham, Andrew Birch, and Megan Fitzpatrick. Our panelists will consider several key questions about the Korean War. What domestic and international forces drove Canada to participate in the UN intervention? How did the Korean War shape and reshape the US-Canada relationship? What did Canada's participation in the war look like? How did Canadian soldiers experience the conflict? What lingering issues did Canadian veterans face after hostilities ceased in 1953? And finally, how is the Korean War remembered today? Before introducing our first panelists, let me thank several of my colleagues. Christopher Sands, director of the Canada Institute, was the intellectual driving force behind this session, uh, and I'm grateful for his direction. Uh, my colleagues Peter Bierstecker and Jacqueline Orr uh, provided key support in putting together the panel together and in running the event this afternoon. And Jean Lee of the Asia program graciously agreed to co-sponsor this event. One more housekeeping note, uh, following presentations from the three panelists, we will open up the discussion to questions and answers with the audience. Audience members will be able to ask a question by using the raise hand function and asking it live when called upon by me, or you can type in your question in the Q&A window or the chat box, in which case I will select and read the questions to the panelists. In the case of the former method, you may get in line with your questions by using the raise hand function. And when I call on you, you will unmute yourself. Okay, we will first hear from Dr. Jack Cunningham today. Jack is the program coordinator of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History at the University of Toronto, the same institution where he received his PhD in history. His publications include co-edited collections on the conflict in Afghanistan and the 2003 invasion of Iraq, and he is also the former editor of International Journal, Canada's principal journal of international affairs. I will introduce Andrew Birch and Megan Fitzpatrick prior to their respective remarks. So Jack, please over to you to start the panel. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Chuck. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, it's apt that, uh, that this event uh, refers to Korea as a forgotten war. In the Canadian public imagination, it is very much that. Uh, although, interestingly enough, but not insignificant, given the uh, the uh, the number of Canadians who participated and the roughly 300 who died in combat. But throughout the conflict, uh, Korea itself was understood by the key Canadian policymakers, notably Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent and External Affairs Minister Lester Pearson, to be peripheral to Canadian interests. Bismarck is, uh, is reputed to have said that his map of Africa was in Europe. Well, Canadian policymakers' map of the Korean Peninsula was largely in Europe, with, uh, with uh, part of the uh, District of Columbia thrown in there for, uh, for good measure. In, in, Ju in June of 1950, when uh, North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel, the assumption in both Washington and Ottawa was that Stalin had acquiesced in, if not instigated, the North's attack. And that's now largely accepted by, uh, by most serious scholars of the conflict. Um, people as, such as uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson, General Dwight Eisenhower, and President Harry Truman himself all were, were uh, worried that Korea might turn out to be a diversion that would bog Western forces down in Asia preparatory to a Soviet move in Europe. Now, the hostilities in Korea were a boon to those in the Truman administration who sought increased defense spending, particularly with regard to the American military presence in Western Europe. So a commitment in Korea was part of the price to pay for a European commitment, and that was understood in Ottawa. And of course, there was also the precedent of aggression going unchecked early enough. The analogy with, uh, with Munich was, uh, was clear to both uh, Lester Pearson and Dean Acheson. Given the relatively untrained state of the South Korean army and the small size of the US force initially in Korea, there were early fears of a rapid defeat, especially after the capital of Seoul falls within, uh, within a few days. But these dire predictions proved wrong, uh, not least because US forces in Japan were rapidly redeployed to, uh, to Korea, and especially after General MacArthur's uh, successful amphibious landing at Incheon in September, which largely reversed the, uh, the course of the, uh, the initial stage of the war. Canada's initial inclination was to send, uh, was to offer three destroyers who arrived at Japan at the end of July. And the, uh, the US response was to put it mildly, not unduly appreciative. It said that when one uh, Canadian official said, this is not a token contribution, his American counterpart replied, okay, let's call it three tokens. But in, uh, in that same month, July and in August, uh, the Canadian cabinet made the decisions to send a, a ground force commitment and in August formed the 2nd Battalion of the Princes Patricias as part of the Canadian Army Special Force for Korea. This battalion trained in the hills of South Korea for two months before becoming the first Canadian formation to engage the enemy in Korea. And in February of 1951, as part of the 1st Commonwealth Division within the U.S. 8th Army, was involved in serious fighting. The, uh, the Princess Pats take part in February in an allied counteroffensive to push enemy troops back beyond the Han River and uh, took their assigned objective, a hill named Hill 419. Again, in April, they took part in the Battle of Kapyong, which uh, Andrew will discuss in more detail, but which saw some of the fiercest uh, fighting uh, take place in the area for which the Canadians were responsible. At one point, uh, the Canadian position was entirely surrounded and Canadian officers had to uh, call artillery fire down on their own position. But on April 25th, the road to the Canadian position had been cleared and the Canadian position was relieved. From then until the end of the war, uh, Canadian troops were engaged in what one historian has called a war of patrols in a relatively small area north of Seoul. Now, the destroyers Canada sent to Korea took an active part in the conflict, shelling North Korean trains and railway lines, and the RCAF played a transport role in Korea, not a combat one initially because it lacked jet fighters. 
when these became available, interestingly enough, they were deployed to Europe, not to, not to Korea. Now, there were uh, differences between Washington and Ottawa over the strategic direction of the uh, of the of the conflict over although many of these were in fact uh, muted or 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 tacit altogether after the successful Incheon landing when uh, UN forces were pressing close to the Chinese border Pearson rejected a, a colleague's suggestion that he call out right for the UN forces to stop at the 30th parallel but he uh, he did uh, he did suggest a ceasefire offer to give the North Koreans a few days to think before the crossing of the parallel, or that they stop at the 39th so as to, so, so as not to alarm the uh, the Chinese into intervention. Yet it's significant in retrospect that there were uh, controversial decisions which Canada did endorse, including a uh, statement of reunification as a war aim and hot pursuit of enemy aircraft into Chinese airspace. Ultimately, uh, despite quibbles about wording, uh, Canada even supported the, uh, the UN resolution branding China an aggressor in the, uh, in the conflict. Canadian policy in Korea really has to be viewed in the context of Canadian-American relations more broadly. And the debate in the US between Atlanticists and Asia firsters. Students of this period are well aware that the Korean War stimulated an across-the-board massive U.S. rearmament effort, which included a substantial American troop commitment in Western Europe. Yet while that seems inevitable in hindsight, it wasn't so at the time. NATO had been concluded in, uh, in 1949 in the wake of the Prague coup, but it was uh, sorely lacking in military assets until the outbreak of the Korean War. And it's in the wake of the outbreak of hostilities that you see NATO endorsing the, uh, the massive conventional buildup outlined in the Lisbon Force Goals. And you see the appointment of Dwight Eisenhower, a Supreme Allied Commander. But there was opposition within the United States to this trend. A lot of so-called isolationist sentiment participated persisted in the U.S. Congress, press, and public, though it's more accurately understood not as isolationist, but as Asia-first sentiment. And in fact, it peaked after China's entry into the Korean War, with congressional Asia-firsters like Robert Taft criticizing American allies for not doing more in Korea and claiming that Europe should shoulder the responsibility for its own defense. And of course, the commander in Korea, General MacArthur, was himself an ardent Asia firster who, who actively sought a wider war in which Chiang Kai-shek would be unleashed, as he, as he put it. In February of 1951, Truman redeploys four divisions to Western Europe, and this triggered the so-called Great Debate in Congress, centered on a resolution which would have precluded him from similar troop deployments without congressional approval. Now, this is defeated on, uh, on April 5th, and uh, on, uh, on April 11th, Truman sacks MacArthur. But um, the, day before, the day before MacArthur is fired, Pearson makes a speech on, uh, on which he says, we have come to the end of relatively easy automatic relations with the United States. And relations were somewhat, uh, somewhat and sometimes uh, tense thereafter. Now, Truman had been under Allied pressure to sack MacArthur, but he fired him for his own reasons, uh, notably a letter to the Republican Speaker of the House, Joe Martin, that criticized the administration for waging a limited war and called for using Taiwanese troops in Korea. This was read by uh, the Speaker from the floor of the House. Now, after, uh, after uh, firing MacArthur, as, uh, as Laura Belmonte has, uh, has, has demonstrated, the Truman administration tried to use the fact that it had done so as leverage with its allies to get them to fall in with U.S. views on how the war should be fought, including a stepped-up air war and the bombing of power stations on the Yalu River. Now, Pearson was right that the days of easy automatic relations were over, but I think it is possible that the solidification of the Europe first tendency in US policy actually liberated American allies to be somewhat more critical of the direction of operations in Korea. Perhaps Canada's strongest dissent from US policy came during the armistice negotiations over the thorny question of the repatriation of POWs. 
The Chinese and North Koreans argued that their POW should be repatriated whether they wanted to go home or not. And the United States was opposed, both as a matter of principle and because it saw propaganda value in POWs refusing to go home. Pearson argued for a fudge. And Atchison was annoyed enough to visit Saint Laurent at one point and press him to overrule Pearson, but Saint Laurent stuck by his minister. After Truman's departure at the end of 1952 and the inauguration of Dwight Eisenhower, and then after the death of Joseph Stalin, the communist powers adopt a somewhat more forthcoming stance on, uh, on repatriations and other armistice issues. And as part of the armistice, there is a neutral nations repatriation commission uh, proposed by, uh, by, uh, by India with uh, discrete support from other Commonwealth members, which devised a rather elaborate repatriation process that actually allowed most POWs to remain free after jumping through a series of administrative hoops. The biggest impact of the Korean War on Canada was actually on defense spending, which was tripled in 1951 and remained at 4% of GDP into the 1960s. It's a bit of an irony that it was Pearson's own government that presided over the rise in social spending that displaced defense in the national order of priorities. But uh, during the period of high defense spending, it's significant that NATO and Western Europe loomed large and took the bulk of, uh, of overseas uh, defense expenditures. We had a brigade group and an air division in Western Europe uh, num numbering 10,000 until uh, the first Prime Minister Trudeau somewhat dramatically reduced it. But uh, by Pearson's time as Prime Minister, the, uh, the European front of the Cold War had stabilized, tensions had dissipated. Canada's high defense spending for much of the Cold War period and heavy allocation to Western Europe does not dip until well into the 1960s. And it's a bit of a paradox that the Korean War helped solidify Canadian Atlanticism in foreign and defense policy. An irony that, uh, that I suspect he would have appreciated himself. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, so we'll now be hearing from Dr. Andrew Birch. Andrew is the Canadian War Museum's post-1945 historian. As curator of Gallery 4, A Violent Peace, he is responsible for all questions relating to conflicts from the beginning of the Cold War to the present day. He has worked to develop temporary and permanent ex exhibitions about the Afghanistan War, the Cyprus peacekeeping mission, the Korean War, military medicine, and other subjects. His book, Give Me Shelter, The Failure of Canada's Cold War Civil Defense, received the 2012 C.P. Stacey Award for Military History. Andrew is also an adjunct research professor with the Department of History at Carleton University, uh, where he also earned his PhD in history. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck. It's a real pleasure to be invited and thank you to the team at the Canada Institute for making this such a seamless experience. Uh, now to uh, definitely introduce a seam into the experience, I'm gonna to try to share my screen and hopefully that won't cause any uh, technological hiccups. Here we go. All right, so uh, I have about 15 minutes in which time I'm going to go through some of the military aspects of Canada's Korean War contribution. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. You've uh, covered off some of that ground, so I don't have to uh, go into quite so much detail early on. But my intention is to give an overall picture of Canada's contribution to the Korean War uh, before focusing in on uh, some of the anniversary um, uh, events that surrounding the anniversary, which took place uh, this uh, starting today and then leading into the weekend, uh, 70 years ago today with the Battle of Kapyong, before pushing on and, and looking at some of the other aspects of the uh, of the Korean War, uh, insofar as I'm able to do so within the, uh, the time allotted. Uh, so uh, just to give a sense, uh, broadly speaking, about Canada and Korea. Uh, so Canada joins the, the uh, United Nations Command uh, in 1950, uh, the initial response was, as, as Jack has said, the dispatch of three uh, Canadian destroyers, uh, one of which was helmed by uh, Commodore Jeffrey Brock, who's the gentleman in color here on the, on the screen. Uh, these ships were one of uh, three of eight that eventually served in Korea, some uh, multiple tours and sailings. 
uh, that served off both coasts of the Korean Peninsula, bombarding coastal targets, uh, providing screening for uh, key assets such as tankers or, uh, or uh, carriers, uh, as well as landing uh, Republic of Korea commandos in some of the disputed islands uh, off the coast of Korea, and notably in some of the screening operations for key uh, naval engagements and landing engagements, such as the, uh, the uh, Incheon landing in September of 1950, some of the approaches to uh, the US fleet that was carrying that out were uh, uh, guarded in part by Canadian ships, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Jeffrey Brock received a distinguished service uh, order for his uh, careful navigation of the canal into Chinampo in December of 1950 to evacuate uh, UN troops and shell uh, assets before they could fall into Chinese hands as the, uh, as the Chinese advance was underway. Uh, the Canadian uh, Air Force had a slightly more limited role in that they were providing a transport squadron, uh, which flew out of Tacoma, Washington. This was 426 Squadron, uh, carrying, um, I think in the end, millions of uh, tons of cargo, uh, thousands and thousands of passengers, and uh, in 599 round trips from Tacoma, Washington, uh, through the Aleutians to Japan and back through Wake Island. Uh, all of which without a hitch and without any uh, casualties. So some marvelous flying and aviation over very difficult and, uh, and, and uh, grueling route. Uh, but there were uh, Canadian pilots that were closer to the ground in Korea. Uh, there were, I believe, about 30 exchange pilots who were flying Sabre aircraft uh, in the Far Eastern Air Force and flying uh, over Korea and doing some of the air superiority mission in Korea. One of them, as shown here, is Flight Lieutenant Andy McKenzie. Uh, he was, uh, his plane was, uh, Sabre was downed in 1952, and he had the distinction of being the uh, longest serving Canadian in, uh, in Chinese custody. Uh, he was uh, taken in 1952 and only released after substantial negotiation in 1954. So uh, Canada did have uh, assets at sea and in the air in Korea, but the main contribution, as Jack had said, was on the ground. So by the time of the armistice in 1953, uh, 26,000 Canadians served in, uh, in Korea and very, or in, in service to Korea. That number expands post armistice as Canadian units stay on and continue in different roles uh, drawing down by 1957. But the main, uh, main force that was present in Korea consistently was in the Canadian Army Brigade. This brigade uh, was a product of the post-1945 priorities of the Canadian government, which were, uh, like many Western governments, to draw down uh, sta large standing forces after years of the Second World War and to focus on domestic issues. Uh, for the military, it was more to focus on things like Arctic sovereignty, uh, this subject that comes up every uh, 20 years or so until people realize how expensive it is. Uh, but then the um, uh, when the Korean emergency took place, the decision was made to dispatch a force to Korea when uh, the uh, South Korean and American defenders were in particularly uh, tough straits. Uh, and the decision to dispatch a special force was made not from the standing forces of the Canadian Army, but rather to recruit a force, especially for service in Korea. Now, this force would eventually become the 25th Canadian Infantry Brigade, uh, but it was uh, advertised as the Canadian Army Special Force. And in August of 1950, armories around the country were flooded by uh, Canadians, about a quarter of whom uh, had seen service during the Second World War, uh, had had a taste of Civ uh, Civvy Street, and perhaps wanted to get back into military um, military lifestyle, or uh, you know, miss that sense of camaraderie. Uh, the fair proportion, though, of uh, the brothers and sons of Second World War veterans who had had uh, a desire to serve during the Second World War, but were simply too young, and saw this uh, Korea adventure as an opportunity to uh, to follow in their uh, in their family's footsteps and. Uh, Others, of course, who are simply tired of working as boilermakers or, or at lumber camps and hard, some of the hard labor after the Second World War and opted for this adventure. I would say conservatively that very, very few would have had any idea about Korea or the particulars of the, uh, of the conflict at the time they signed up, save that the communists were on the march and, uh, and the accompanying uh, media coverage of that sort of nature. Uh, the brigade, uh, Trained various spots, the, uh, the, gen the gentlemen in the line uh, here, I believe are at Petawawa in Ontario, possibly Wainwright, I'm not 
I'd have to go back and check the reference, awaiting their uh, intake into the Canadian Armed Forces, their basic training. And after some training, they would then board trains heading to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, where they would re receive further training and then would be dispatched on troop ships over to, uh, to Japan and subsequently to, um, uh, to Busan in, um, uh, in the south, uh, southern tip of, of the Korean Peninsula. And the, they did not go over all at once. The first group went over uh, to go over was the second battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, uh, who were shown on the right of the, uh, the photo I've just sharing here. And this was during the March in February. So they'd arrived in Busan. There was a desire by I believe the Americans had had, had hope that the Canadians would enter straight into the lines owing to the uh, rather urgent situation uh, and the need to, uh, to staff the front lines in the in the midst of a counteroffensive, uh, but their commander, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Jim Stone, uh, said uh, no. They needed a bit more time to train, uh, to become acclimatized to the rather hilly country and the rather physically demanding aspects of uh, of the you know, tactical training they would need to succeed in these uh, sharp advances through hilly country. And so, from February to March, as part of the uh, uh, the Eighth Army offensive, uh, they were then they were at that time part of the 27th Commonwealth Infantry Brigade. And this was a composite unit with uh, Canadian battalions, Australian battalions, uh, British units, uh, New Zealanders, uh, all of which were part of that uh, US 8th Army structure that was advancing to try to stabilize lines that had been breached by previous uh, Chinese offensives and trying to get up to a defensive line uh, that where the UN could have a stabilized um, defense of, the, uh, of the South Korea. And it's in this context that we come to the anniversary today, which is the, uh, the 22nd of April of 1951 is when the uh, Chinese fifth phase offensive starts off. And this map is borrowed from the uh, Center for Military History in the United States uh, and shows a sense of the weight of the um, uh, weight and scale of the offensive. So this was an offensive that was across the entirety of the peninsula that involved both North Korean and Chinese army groups. Uh, that uh, and the US and the Republic of Korea and all the United Nations Command uh, arrayed in that line, which you can see at the, uh, at the top, the solid line, uh, was kind of the start line for the 22nd. And the goal of the Chinese Fifth Offensive was to push south as far as possible, encircle and destroy United Nations units uh, with the added objective of taking, uh, taking Seoul. And in the midst of this um, offensive, as it was taking out, the Canadians had previously, with the uh, the Commonwealth Infantry Brigade, been brought back into uh, reserve. So in the center, uh, more or less, of the uh, UN front, uh, in the kind of sleepy Kapyong River Valley, uh, that is where the Canadians and Australians waited. The main hammer of the Chinese offensive fell further north and hit the 6th Division Republic of Korea uh, Army. Uh, and the survivors were trickling through the lines of the Australians and the Canadians through the Capion River Valley on the 23rd of, 3rd of April, uh, as uh, two units to the left and right were falling back under the brunt of the, of the Chinese offensive. And so the battle itself unfolds over two nights, uh, taking place in, uh, again, in the Capion River Valley. Uh, this map is from the Canadian Official History, which was published in the 1960s, and it's a pretty, pretty good map. I was looking for better and clearer ones, uh, but uh, settled on this. And so you can kind of see that there are two uh, dominating features in the Kapyong River Valley. There's Hill 504 uh, uh, yeah, and Hill 677, which uh, together we take as the Battle of Kapyong. And in the first evening, the, uh, the Australians who are on the, on the right side on Hill 504, reinforced by a US uh, 72nd US Tank Battalion, or A Company, I believe, of that, of that battalion, uh, put up a very, very uh, stout defense, um, dulling the Chinese momentum and uh, taking quite a few casualties in, this, in, the, um, in the time, I believe 32 dead uh, over the night of the, uh, over the 23rd, which the Canadians had a pretty good view of from the commanding position of Hill 677 across the, across the valley. The following day as, uh, as light turned to, light turned to uh, night turned to day and uh, there were some individual probes throughout the day, but the main attack came in earnest in the evening. Uh, and night of the 24th, uh, 25th April, when uh, the main force of the, uh, of, of, uh, of the Chinese that had swept through the, Cana the Australian positions, the Australians had then withdrawn through the Middlesex Regiment um, uh, positions that are shown there, 
and then the Chinese wheeled around to encircle and try to destroy the Canadians on Hill 677. And it was through that night that the, uh, the fighting took place, uh, defended in qu close quarters combat uh, using heavy machine gun fire and, uh, and light machine gun fire. And eventually, uh, depending on the weight of firepower from the 16th Field New Zealand Regiment, which was located uh, right near the village of Kapyong proper, uh, when in the early hours of the morning uh, and D company positions, which were on the apex of Hill 677, uh, were uh, basically at hand-to-hand -hand fighting and had to call in uh, artillery fire onto their own positions, uh, catching the Chinese out in the open and able to counterattack and retake those positions. While well, briefly encircled on the morning of the 25th, uh, eventually that uh, those avenues were cleared and the Canadians were able to be withdrawn and relieved. Uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, ink is spilled and, and uh, commentary is said about how uh, Kapyong saves Seoul, uh, Kapyong saves, saves Korea. Uh, I think that's a little overheated uh, in terms of its, uh, of its significance. The main significance of, of the Kapyong battle is, uh, is I think twofold. One is that it does meet uh, an objective of preventing the Chinese from taking some transport corridors that would endanger Seoul. And at the same time, uh, bought time for the United Nations on both the Eastern and Western flanks of the, uh, the Chinese thrust into Central Korea to uh, regroup and uh, to uh, dull the momentum and stop the momentum of the Chinese offensive, which then meant that uh, the objective of encircling and destroying units uh, would not be realized. Uh, the Chinese in the, had followed a pattern of very uh, swift, sharp offensives that could then not be followed up logistically and could not be uh, resupplied swiftly. So essentially that, that Holding fast and pouring on firepower to stall the stall the momentum of the uh, of these offensives was the way that the UN responded uh, and proved quite effectively. Uh, it also showed, uh, I think, that uh, that that combined firepower uh, method uh, was repeated throughout any number of combats that followed in Korea. Uh, and in the years since, it's been held up properly in large part because the United States recognizes Canada, the United States, uh, the uh, and the Royal Australian Regiment uh, with the uh, presidential unit citation. And uh, Canadians often do look on things that other people recognize, perhaps a little more readily than we do ourselves. So that that uh, that nod to the Canadian units in their defense of Korea. Uh, meant a lot, I think, for the public memory of the Korean War and the significance of the battle. But as we go back to the actual battle itself, uh, it was one battle amid many, many, many that stalled that Chinese offensive. It can't be singularly uh, credited, much like the uh, Battle of Vimy Ridge in 1917 can't be uh, uh, credited solely to the Canadians. It was part of a much bigger effort. As uh, Jack mentioned, the battles that followed in, Ka in uh, the Cap Young uh, battle uh, tended to be shorter in duration and tended to be of, uh, of smaller of scale uh, in terms of the numbers of, of men involved, but they were no less intense. Uh, as armistice negotiations took place and Canadians took up their position along the defensive line as part of the first Commonwealth Division, which was formed in the summer of 1951, uh, those uh, nightly forays into the no man's land between Chinese held hills and uh, Canadian held hills, UN held hills, uh, were a means to gather intelligence to repair um, uh, problems with the defensive line, to try to capture prisoners and gather intelligence about future intentions and to forestall future raids. But as the uh, static lines uh, took forward, uh, took form, uh, so too did greater and greater concentrations of Chinese fire. So by the time 1952 and 1953 were taking place, uh, these the raids the Chinese uh, forces would mount uh, from their hills onto UN positions would be you know terrifying in terms of their uh, the, the weight of fire that was coming on and very challenging fights. So to look at Kapyong in isolation and to forget some of the other battles, particularly the the Battle of Hill 277 by the Vendusiem in uh, um, after the, the rest of the brigade came around in, uh, in May of 1951 and then through to the fall in November of 1951 when this battle took place, the battles of Hill 355 and the battles of, uh, of Hill 187 uh, all hold a place among Korean veterans. But uh, like many, uh, like it's very hard to say 
uh, have much attachment to these battles, which are on numbered hills, whereas Kep Yong has an identifiable uh, place. So the, the war patrols took, took place uh, night after night and a steady trickle of casualties until the armistice of July of 1953, uh, which Canadians viewed with skepticism that the likelihood was that it would not hold. And of course, that ended up uh, not being the case, that the, uh, it did hold, but Canadians remained in Korea uh, in diminishing numbers through to 1957, uh, although they maintained an active role in the UN Commission uh, monitoring the armistice, uh, which uh, holds to this day. Um, and in terms of the cost to Canadians, uh, Jack had mentioned that there are 300, some Canadians killed in combat. There's 312 Canadians who are killed in combat, three in the Navy, 309 in the um, in the army. Uh, the remainder die from accidental uh, deaths uh, and uh, other, other means uh, up till the December of 1956 is when we stopped counting. Uh, of those, 378 are buried at the UN Memorial Cemetery in Busan. Uh, this map that I'm sharing with you now is something that I've been working on uh, fairly steadily for the last uh, few years. This is a, uh, a Google map where I've actually plotted out with uh, casualty records where all 516 Canadians fell, be it in Canada, the United States, Japan, or in, uh, in, in uh, Korea. Uh, and that's available, and I can share the link to that uh, perhaps in the chat. Uh, and that's all I have uh, to say today. So I will stop talking and, and hand the mic back to you, Chuck. Okay, great. Thank you uh, very much, Andrew. Um, so last but certainly not least, uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Megan Fitzpatrick uh, as a panelist. So Megan is a strategic, strategic analyst with the Defense Research and Development Canada and an adjunct professor of war studies at the Royal Military College of Canada. Specializing in military mental health and resilience, she has published in journals such as Social History of Medicine and War and Society. Uh, and most importantly, she is the author of the 2017 book, Invisible Scars, Mental Trauma and the Korean War. Megan has received recognition for her scholarship and for her work, including the Center for Operational, Operational Research and Analysis Award for Outstanding Achievement in Defense Analysis uh, in 2020. So Megan, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully we should be able to share my slides and avoid any technical snafus on my end. Fantastic, thank you. And I'll just call out those slides as they come. So good afternoon. Thank you again for that introduction. I'm excited to be here this afternoon to help round out such a fantastic panel. Jack and Andrew have already done an exceptional job at telling you about the political and the diplomatic aspects of Canada's involvement, as well as outlining a number of the major battles and talking about the military action at a high level. So with that in mind, I want to take you down on the ground to get a better sense of what it was like to be one of the men sitting in those trenches thousands of miles from home and to carry that experience with you in the years that followed. Now, as Andrew has already made clear, Korea was a ferocious and a bitter conflict that threw the lives of countless civilians and soldiers into disarray. And it was a key turning point in the early Cold War. Now, what many people don't know is that it was also a pivotal turning point in the history of battlefield medicine and of survival. And that's because this is the very first time that we see the systematic deployment of helicopters to evacuate the wounded, as well as the development of mobile army surgical hospital units, also known as MASH units and probably better known by everyone because of the TV show. And that means that mortality rates are appreciably lower in Korea than in previous conflicts. So around 34 men per thousand wounded in comparison to around 66 per thousand during the Second World War. And those rates continued to improve from 1951 to 1953 as the front line stabilizes and those casualty evacuation lines become somewhat more robust. But that's certainly not to say that it was easy to live or to operate in Korea, certainly not. Uh, rugged and mountainous, summers were marked by flooding and the arrivals of rodents and insects. And in the winter, temperatures would regularly drop below minus 20 degrees Celsius, which I believe is about minus four uh, Fahrenheit. And in the first winter in 1950 to 1951, 
over 8,000 UN servicemen were treated for some form of cold weather injury. So something like frostbite or trench foot. And I think one of the most vivid descriptions that I've heard of just what it was like to experience a Korean winter came from one US Marine surgeon who commented that the only way that you could tell the living from the dead was whether or not their eyes moved. And it's these kind of conditions, these kind of extreme conditions that take a toll both physically and psychologically. In a war zone, psychological scars are as inevitable as those that are left by bullets, by bombs, and by shrapnel. And Korea was really no different than any other campaign. In fact, it seemed like it was a theater primed for disaster. When the Canadian troops were first deployed, they were not prepared for what they would face, as I think has already been made clear. Their training was woefully incomplete, and they knew very, very little about the enemy who they were expected to face. What's more, the Canadian government had rushed to screen those first troops uh, when, they, when they deployed them. And that meant that many of the first men to arrive in Korea came with previous undiscovered conditions, things that really should have been obvious to a medical officer like chronic bronchitis and hypertension. Uh, and in the first six months alone, nearly 20% of the Canadian Army Special Force had to be repatriated because of disciplinary and psychiatric problems. Now, early on, medical support is fragmentary, and it's because of this that the majority of physical and psychological casualties are simply evacuated to Japan. And the majority are evacuated through this vast American evacuation chain back to Tokyo and on to the United States. And that means that it's exceptionally difficult to return them to duty in the field. Now, eventually some of those problems get solved when you have the formation of a Commonwealth division in the summer of 1951. And they start to employ their own medical specialists, including a psychiatrist who keeps the men in Korea for treatment as those front lines stabilize. Now throughout the war, psychiatric cases make up around five to 9% of your total casualties, which is in fact what we would continue to see in a deployment today. And is often the case in a war zone, Canadian soldiers suffered from a wide range of psychological conditions but they can be generally categorized in three categories, namely anxiety related, uh, behavioral, and finally those related to battle exhaustion, which is a contemporary term for something that we would understand as akin to post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, slide please. Great. Now at this time, the psychiatric care available in theater was exceptionally basic. Soldiers would first be taken to a regimental aid post, like the one you see in the photo here, where they could rest for up to 24 hours. Now, men who had more severe symptoms would have been evacuated further back by a field ambulance to a larger medical unit, in this instance, a field dressing station, where they would be sedated while they were in hospital. And this was to help them to rest and to refrain from negative patterns of thought. And that was a very popular theory for psychiatric treatment at the time. Now, once a diagnosis was confirmed, they would have undergone several sessions of psychotherapy uh, with the unit psychiatrist. But this isn't the recline on the couch and tell me all your deepest secrets variety of psychotherapy. It's not anything close to, to Freudian. Uh, it's very practical. Doctors were principally interested in relieving symptoms that would interfere with combat effectiveness. So as in previous wars, the soldier's ability to function in the field was prioritized over restoring their previous state of mental health. Slide, please. Now over 50% returned to some form of duty with rates peaking at about 83%. And the Americans similarly reported rates between 65 to 90% return to duty. However, if a casualty could not return to their unit, it didn't necessarily mean they would be evacuated as is the case in this image. Whenever possible, troops were re-employed along the line, either in Korea or in more sheltered conditions in Japan. After all, manpower was a very precious commodity. Slide, please. So this gives you a picture of some of the conditions that Canadian troops would have experienced while they were in Korea. 
But there's another group that sometimes gets even less attention and recognition in what is already a forgotten war, and that's prisoners of war. So from 1950 to 1953, over 13,000 UN troops were captured by the Chinese and North Koreans, and that included a small group of Canadians. This is the first time that communist countries hold this number of Western POWs, and negotiations for the repatriation of these men arguably prolonged the war for months, if not years. Now, prisoners of war have always been an incredibly useful source of military intelligence, but it's in Korea that they also become vital tools of propaganda in an increasingly polarized Cold War. Now, the Chinese methodically interrogated Western POWs about everything from military operations to their personal lives and their political affiliations. And they really pressed them to participate in what were termed re-education sessions where they would learn about communist philosophy. Uh, they would also be coerced into signing peace petitions denouncing the UN war effort. And because nobody successfully escapes from these camps, which are hundreds of miles from the front lines, Western officials can only speculate as to actually what's going on behind enemy lines. So in the absence of accurate information, speculation starts to fill the newspapers and paranoia reaches its height when a group of US airmen falsely confess to participating in acts of germ warfare. Now, unable to confirm or to dismiss the story, Western journalists ponder the possibilities of brainwashing, which is actually a term that originates with the Korean War, and behavioral modification. At the height of the Cold War, anything seemed possible. And when 21 American servicemen and one Royal Marine refused repatriation at the end of the war, it seemed that all these bizarre theories that had been going around were true. And while it's now very clear that the communists did not have mysterious brainwashing abilities, in fact, it was just old interrogation methods, what happened in Korea did have a very lasting impact. So for example, if this is when we see Western countries like Canada, the US and the UK develop highly realistic survival evasion, resistance and escape or SEER training, uh, which they continue to use to this day. And it's when the US adopts a new code of conduct for captured servicemen that would have a significant impact during the Vietnam War. And we're still very much living with the cultural legacy of the POWs in Korea. I think all you have to do is watch the Manchurian candidate uh, to get an idea of that. Slide please. Okay, so. The question then becomes what happened to these men, both the prisoners and those who served in Korea more generally. Well, in the Canadian case, veterans were entitled to exactly the same type of compensation as their World War II predecessors. And those who had been injured could apply for a pension that would vary depending on the severity of the handicap involved and how it impinged on their earning capacity. And that system allowed many men to successfully transition uh, to civilian life and indeed to flourish. But it proved exceptionally problematic who, for those who came back with invisible scars. And that's because this is a system that's completely designed around the idea of measuring and of quantifying disability. And that's exceptionally difficult to do when it comes to the mind. Now, globally, disability pensions were not designed for the psychologically traumatized. So for instance, if you had a family history of mental health problems, it was almost impossible to prove that your disability was directly connected to your war service. There were many, many pitfalls in this process that made it difficult for men to access pensions. And I think one statistic in particular really speaks to that. Britain and Canada sent around 80% of the Commonwealth troops that were sent to Korea. But in 1956, only 3% of those men were receiving a disability pension or a pension of any kind for that matter. And if that wasn't bad enough, Korean War veterans were also often denied forms of public acknowledgement. So during the 1950s, Korea was described as a relatively minor police action, oftentimes by Western politicians, not a war. And unlike both world wars, the public was barely involved in the prosecution of this conflict by comparison. Uh, 
So when these men come home, they often don't get the kind of welcome that they expect. So for instance, Don Flieger was a member of the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps, and he's evacuated from Korea in 1952 after falling ill with epidemic hemorrhagic fever. And when he's eventually released from hospital, he goes home to New Brunswick and he decides to visit his local legion in his uniform. But he is refused entry by the local members of that legion because they say that he's not a veteran. And that's a story that's actually far more common than you would expect. I heard it many, many times from British, Australian and Canadian veterans uh, having similar experiences as well as being denied uh, home loans when they would claim that they were veterans. Now, Korea is called the Forgotten War for a reason. And I think that's because it brings up some vital questions about commemoration and why we choose to remember one war versus another. And no matter how advanced military medicine may become or how many people may successfully return from war, how society responds to returning service personnel is pivotal in how they process those experiences and ultimately reconcile themselves to loss. World War II veterans were generally celebrated, Vietnam vets were abused, and in many cases, Korean War veterans were simply ignored. So when it comes to the human cost of Korea, it has a long, a lasting, and I think as you can see here, a very complicated legacy. So with that, I'll wrap up and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to Jack, Andrew, and Megan uh, for three very insightful presentations. Uh, and thank you uh, to all three of you for sticking within the time limits. So we have plenty of time for discussion with the audience. Um, so as a reminder, uh, you will be able to ask a question to the panelists by either using the raise hand function and asking it live, uh, or you can type your questions in the Q&A window or the chat box, in which case I will select and read them uh, to the panelists. In the case of the former method, you may get in line with your questions by using the raise hand function. And when I call on you, uh, you will unmute yourself. Um, so to start out, we had a couple of questions that were uh, in the chat box, uh, sorry, in the Q&A window that uh, are similar. So I'll try to combine them. And I think they would probably be directed towards Andrew uh, with regards to the Battle of Cap Young. And they uh, basically the questions are in reference to the level of collaboration and cooperation between uh, Commonwealth units in Korea, such as the Australians that you mentioned that were also present in, in the Battle of Cap Young. Um, uh, and one of, the, one of the individuals who asked uh, one of these questions, uh, they note that there's a new book called In From the Cold, which is the latest account to emerge on Australia's experience in the Korean War. And they said there are lots of parallels with the Canadian experience. Um, so how significant was the collaboration between Commonwealth units in the Battle of Cap Young? Uh, or in other contexts within the Korean War. Uh, thanks. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a good question. The it, it's I would say well that they they collaborated well, although uh, they had their own objectives. So the, in the Battle of Cap Young, the the uh, three R R A R had their objective as the defense of Hill Five Hundred Four, two B P C L I that of Hill Six Seven Seven. And that was coordinated through the 27th uh, Commonwealth Infantry Brigade's headquarters, which was located further south uh, to Cap Yong. Uh, none of this, I think, would have been an immense departure for either the Australians or the Canadians, who had both served, after all, uh, in, in had, had history of serving under British command in the, uh, the Second World War or in the First World War. Uh, it is a bit of a new thing that they're all serving together in this composite Commonwealth unit. Uh, but they would have shared many of the same military traditions and doctrine and training, uh, especially that specific to Korea, but certain things such as calling in artillery and comms protocols and all that sort of stuff would have been, would have been fairly standard across. And that, that cooperation only deepens uh, through the summer of 1950, uh, summer of 1951 and, and afterwards, where the Canadians and the Americans are, uh, Canadians and the Australians and the, the Brits and New Zealanders are all sharing a divisional area. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, one of, one of the pieces we have in our, our collection at the uh, Canadian War Museum uh, in the display uh, is the grand uh, 
one of the great things in the front line was that soldiers would often swap uh, weapons. Uh, if they didn't like their Lee Enfield, they might go for an M2 Garand or something. And one of the pieces we have on display is an M2 Garand that was uh, donated by a Canadian who had picked it up in the divisional area that had been left behind by an Australian and had that Australian's name uh, inscribed on it with three R with the uh, Royal Australian Regiment. And so uh, we were able to actually track down uh, who that person was. So they, they shared the same facilities, they shared the same doctrine, uh, and they shared the same mission. So I would characterize the, uh, the defenses, the um, uh, it is very good. And uh, in addition to that book that was referenced, there's also, I believe, Simon Theobald's book, uh, The uh, Imjin and Kapyong Battles, which is a very good uh, examination of the kind of more Commonwealth approach, which would be worth, uh, if you're interested, to check that out. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have some, uh, an audience member named David Wallace who is asking about the uh, why, why we call the Korean War the Forgotten War. Um, and Megan spoke a little bit about this, but I wonder if, if Megan or perhaps the other panelists could elaborate on, you know, is this actually a forgotten war in Canada? Uh, that's what we call it in the United States. I think that's, it's a little bit debatable if it's actually forgotten in, in the US context, but that's the common, uh, that's commonly how we refer to it. Um, so I wonder if you could reflect on, on this question. Um, is is the Korean War a forgotten war in Canada? And if so, why? Well, well, maybe I, I can jump in. Oh, OK. If you, you, you go first if you'd like. I'll just get the, the ball rolling on that. So uh, I guess some of the, the ways that you can, can see that it is perhaps a forgotten war in Canada is just looking at things like when the official history of the Korean War was written uh, in each of the Commonwealth countries. In fact, uh, the official histories of the Second World War are written almost during the war itself and published immediately afterwards, whereas you have to wait several decades in almost all of the Commonwealth countries when it comes to the Korean War to see a similar history. Uh, in addition, while memorials pop up in Korea itself to, to the soldiers that participated in the conflict, you don't see Commonwealth memorials to the Korean War uh, with the same prominence as, as World War II monuments until decades later, so in the 80s and 90s. And in fact, uh, a British memorial to the Korean War was only dedicated maybe six or seven years ago in front of the Ministry of Defense. So in terms of those actual physical symbols of remembrance and Korea having its own unique presence as opposed to being just incorporated into the existing monuments, uh, you certainly don't see that until decades later. So those visible symbols, I think, speak to that. I would add that uh, the Korean War is largely forgotten in Canada because so few people uh, actually experienced it at the time. I mean, if we compare it to World War II, for example, where, where there was, uh, where the war impinged on nearly every aspect of daily life with uh, rationing, with constant propaganda, with rigid government regimentation of most aspects of, uh, of one's daily doings. And in, uh, in Korea, this was not, uh, not the case at all. It, it takes place against the backdrop of, uh, of the long post-war boom that lasts into the late 60s, early, 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 early 70s. And unless, unless you were uh, either serving in the conflict or were, uh, were related or knew someone who was, you could go about your daily life uh, completely oblivious to what was happening in Korea. And as a result, uh, because the collective experience of it was so shallow, I think the collective memory of it is equally shallow. I might just add very quickly that the, uh, in terms of uh, popular culture and acknowledgement of the Korean War, uh, it, it, like many other post-war missions, including NATO and UN peacekeeping operations, and, and arguably going forward, even things like Afghanistan, do, do not occupy the same cultural space and popular memory as, say, the Second World War, or particularly in Canada's case, the First World War. These are just mammoth, mammoth conflicts that, um, against which uh, things pale in comparison. And yet, for the people who served there and went through it, it's been left on their own the veterans themselves to argue for and to agitate for greater recognition, inclusion in monuments, uh, and uh, to the extent that places like Korea have done much more in terms of uh, acknowledging and uh, promoting uh, 
uh, history of the uh, of the war than perhaps the the contributor nations, uh, with the exception perhaps of, of the United States, uh, which I will add has a very lovely Korean War Memorial in Washington that acknowledges Canada, which we always like. All right, uh, this next question, it, it may be most appropriate for Jack, but uh, if, if others have comments, uh, please feel, to, feel free to weigh in. Uh, and it concerns the reactions and sort of issues raised by the Chinese intervention in uh, fall 1950 for Canadian policy towards the Korean conflict. So how did Canada react to this massive Chinese entry into the Korean War? Well, Canada uh, continued to uh, hold it, hold its corner and fight in uh, in Korea, but had uh, had uh, discre discreetly tried to caution uh, MacArthur against uh, and the American administration against uh, against precipitating Chinese intervention. The the, the Canadian concern was that uh, we didn't want a wider war in what was viewed in the context of the overall Cold War balance of, 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 of forces as a, as a bit of a sideshow. As, as, as I said earlier, uh, Canada's uh, map of Korea was largely in Europe. Uh, the Canadian policymakers were cold warriors, and they were fundamentally cold warriors just as much as their American counterparts were. But they saw Europe as the uh, as the keystone of the of the Western Arch. They were uh, they were they were committed Atlanticists, and they 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 doubted the uh, the wisdom and the practicality of uh, of a wider war. Great, uh, and I think this next one, this next question, uh, is probably most appropriate for Andrew, and it concerns uh, the extent of Canadian air support uh, in the Korean War. So, how extensive was Canadian air support, and what planes were involved? Uh, the air support were uh, that was provided was, as I mentioned, primarily transport aircraft. I believe, oh, I'm having a moment. Uh, had my AstraZeneca shot yesterday, so I'm a little shaky and brain foggy. But it's, uh, I believe there are uh, perhaps Buffalo aircraft that were flying from 426 Squadron. Uh, and those uh, transport aircraft were uh, the primary means. And uh, in terms of more local forces serving in Korea, most of the USAF exchange pilots were flying in F-86 uh, Sabre uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, and there were, however, uh, Canadian artillery officers who were flying uh, smaller uh, prop planes like the Oster uh, Air, Observation, or Air Observation Post, uh, such as uh, Peter Tease, who uh, actually his plane went down twice during the uh, during uh, uh, combats, but you know coordinates something like 600 shoots from the uh, from the air uh, from the that vantage point. So it's a there's a variety of aircraft that are involved, but the the main bulk of the air mission was in that uh, supply. Um, uh, supply uh, posting, which was flying that round trip from Washington to Shemya, and then to uh, and then to Japan, and then back through, and uh, doing so again without uh, you know significant incident and uh, and no no fatalities in that case. I think that covers it. Great. Um, I think this one should go to uh, to Megan, and it is how did or how does the Republic of Korea or South Korea's recognition of Canadian sacrifice contribute to a national military identity and influence mental health issues for those who participated uh, in the Korean War. I mean, if we're, if we're speaking about the impact it has on Commonwealth troops and specifically Canadian troops and their, their sense of identity, I know it's been an extremely important thing to the veteran community that uh, oftentimes the South Korean government has funded trips for veterans to return to Korea uh, to visit the cemetery there uh, and the memorials. So I think that means a great deal to them in the, the sense of identity that they share around being veterans of that particular conflict. Although I think that uh, the, the part that probably troubles them more is the length of time it took to get that that same level of recognition uh, by their own fellow countrymen. It took a, a great deal of time, as I said, uh, for memorials to spring up in Commonwealth countries, in Western countries. And still recognition of Korea is, is relatively, relatively low in comparison to when we look at the popular memory 
of other major conflicts, despite the fact that when you look at this deployment, it's one of the most significant, biggest deployments of Canadian manpower in the 20th century. Great, we've got another question for Jack. Uh, and uh, this, this audience member uh, suggests that you may not acknowledge the desperate situation around the Pusan area in June, July, August, 1950. It seems that Canada's help at that time would have been most necessary. US troops were not that prepared. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you have a, a response to this, this comment. Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I skipped over that in, uh, in passing, but it's certainly the case that the Canadians acquitted themselves uh, admirably on, uh, on that occasion. Um, I have a sort of a, a, an applied history question um, for, for, can be for all of you, um, but you know, since this is the, the Wilson Center, uh, we love history, but we don't always study history for history's sake. Um, so I'm wondering if you can, you know, think about or reflect on what were the sort of historical lessons for Canada, uh, you know, drawing from its participation in the Korean War. Um, you know, did the Korean War, how did the Korean War shape subsequent Canadian policy towards other Cold War conflicts uh, that its allies became involved in? Um, or what were some of the other historical lessons that Canadian policymakers may have drawn from the Canadian experience in Korea? And this, again, this, this can be for, for all three of you or um, so whoever wants to jump in first, please do. I might just, uh, first of all, it was North, North Star aircraft, not Buffalo aircraft. Uh, yeah. There we go. Uh, the, uh, uh, I would say that the lessons learned for uh, Korea in terms of the military side, uh, I'm in full agreement with with uh, Jack that the uh, you know Canada's map of uh, uh, map of Korea was in Europe and obviously had uh, the wartime emergency uh, of Korea. I think many scholars have made a very convincing argument that was pretty much the time when if Canada wasn't taking the uh, the Cold War seriously, uh, they they certainly started taking it more urgently and that's reflected in defense spending it's reflected in some of those commitments uh but my response to the question would i think be down to the the unit level and i think it might even answer a question i saw in the chat from howard uh, howard coombs hi howard uh which was that at the at the institutional level of the canadian army uh the experience in korea builds on that of the second world war and a lot of the unlike in the second world war where a lot of the people go home and they immediately uh get out there are quite a few who manage to stay on uh in the in the units uh that serve and continue to serve and prepare to fight the next war in, in europe and their experience in korea becomes uh, a, a fairly important part of uh, regimental life and informs training and informs uh how people respond it's that lived experience of of battle uh, that Megan did such a great job of, of, uh, of bringing out that then has another life and another importance at the unit level and uh, is reflected in the names and places that uh, where Canadians serve. And uh, for example, like Drop Zone Buxton uh, is named after a Korean War, a Korean War veteran who, uh, who later continued to, uh, to jump as a paratrooper after the, uh, in the Cold War period. So I would say it, the, the, the lessons uh, and, and legacy of the Korean War have an impact that goes unseen from the policy level, but nonetheless has an institutional life uh, within the military. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add, uh, except to reiterate that on the, uh, on the policy side, it, uh, it does see uh, Canada taking the, uh, the Cold War seriously to the extent that we do undertake this uh, by uh, historical standards, a very long live commitment to uh, to Western Europe's defense and keep troops there for uh, for a very long time indeed. I mean, you could argue that uh, having them there until uh, until until the uh, the Mulroney government finally winds up the commitment altogether is the. Uh, I mean, this is the stuff of Roman legions for heaven's sake. And it uh, and it owes it owes it owes a lot to the uh, the, uh, the uh, to, to Korea. Yeah, I would add that I'd uh, reinforce uh, what Andrew said about it driving uh, rearmament and significant defense spending in Canada for the remainder of the 1950s. But I would also add that this is really a, a turning point in Commonwealth relations. Uh, as much as it was a, a successful uh, alliance and it was a successful Commonwealth division, mm -hmm. 
it wasn't without its tensions. Uh, Canada originally doesn't want to join a Commonwealth division and it only does so under a great deal of pressure from its uh, American allies to be able to join. And I think you really see a, a change in the relation between the Commonwealth partners in past during the Second World War, uh, the other Commonwealth dominions, so Canada, Australia, and New Zealand would often defer to the British and let them take the lead in terms of military organization. Uh, but here you see them pushing back and it's finally an opportunity for them to take on a more senior role. They're not willing to be the junior partner that they were in other conflicts. And as much as they do successfully collaborate in this conflict and work together very effectively, especially because of that shared military tradition, I think Korea is a, is a turning point for them in seeing themselves as equal partners to the British and as uh, independent players in the military space and politically rather than just a, a junior partner there. It's worth pointing out, and I'm going to shout out here to uh, Robert Barnes, who's, uh, who's done important work on this, that uh, when, uh, when, when the Commonwealth participants are able to uh, unite around a common position and push it forward. They actually have some success with the Americans. They do on uh, on the repatriation of POWs, and that's uh, that's often a quite striking contrast with what happens when it's an individual Commonwealth member with uh, with a a different point of view. Great. Uh you know, one of the drawbacks of doing these types of events online is that uh, it's uh, more difficult for the panelists to ask questions of one another. So I, I, I do want to leave open that possibility that if, uh, if appears to feel free to interject. Um, I guess with my, my previous question about sort of historical lessons, in the United States, you can't really, um, when you talk about, for example, why the United States got involved in Vietnam, sort of the analogy to Korea is always there. So I was curious if, if any of you could reflect on that sort of, I know Canada did not get involved in the Vietnam War, but if, if the, you know, the Korean War was also part of these discussions towards conflicts like Vietnam. Well, you may recall that at, uh, at one point, uh, Lester Pearson goes down to Temple University and uh, delivers a speech calling for a bombing halt in Vietnam that, uh, that absolutely enrages uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Pearson, in particular, who's prime minister at the, for, 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 for the early stages of the American involvement, in, uh, in, 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 in Vietnam, at least much of the early stage, is, uh, is, is fairly consistently uh, skeptical. He, uh, he seems to have had the, had the view, and I think Korea may have solidified it, that uh, containing communism in Asia was probably something best left to the Asians themselves. And he saw India as having a crucial role in this context and, uh, and was, 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 was wary of, uh, of, of, of military adventures thereafter. He, 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 uh, he's, he's, whether, uh, whether how, exactly how direct the influence was, I can't say. I haven't come across it in any of the documents I've seen, but uh, I would be surprised if it had not at least, uh, at least reinforced that conviction on his part. Uh, if I might join, my, my, uh, my understanding is that during the uh, commissions in Geneva that take place post armistice in Korea, uh, I believe that Canada gets volunteered uh, to join the Indochina commissions. And so while Canada is not formally a combatant in, in Vietnam for about 20 years, or, or well, uh, give or take, uh, there is this ongoing commitment to serve on the, uh, the tripartite commissions uh, that are uh, do have, have a variety of important roles in terms of monitoring how the war is going and reporting on uh, intelligence and acting as intelligence gathering and generally being a forum for the Cold War, uh, uh, Cold War divide. But it was not a role that Canada sought and not one that Can Canadians particularly enjoyed. Uh, but there was an ongoing presence in, in uh, you know, in Vietnam and Laos and, and elsewhere. Uh, as well as a sizable number of Canadians, uh, the precise number, which is a little hard to determine, who decided to join Korea, uh, to join the uh, uh, American war in Vietnam, uh, wearing U.S. uniforms. And uh, there's some numbers that are subject to change here, but uh, as many as 30,000. Uh, so com 
commensurate with the number of, uh, of uh, those who, um, uh, conscientious objectors and others who traveled north, there were there also those who traveled south, uh, although it's a little harder to track that down. But uh, some, somewhere about 127 plus Canadians were killed uh, yeah. in, in American units. Uh, so there was, there, while it was a, uh, not a direct link, there was definitely a few causal links between Korea to Vietnam, uh, but uh, in a most kind of unexpected way at Geneva. Great, thank you. Um, and to our audience members, as a reminder, you can ask questions using the uh, raise hand function if, you, if you'd like to ask your question live, uh, or you can put it in the Q&A window. Um, I think we, we've covered this a little bit, but this is a, a, in terms of, you know, we've talked about Canada's relationship with other Commonwealth countries during the war. Um, we've covered this in sort of broader terms, but I wonder if anyone, uh, as one of our audience members asked, could speak to the relationship with the United Kingdom uh, during the war. Well, the Canadians and the, and the British often had the, uh, the same the same skepticism about uh, about MacArthur's leadership during the during during his tenure as uh, as 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 UN as UN commander they were very much on the same page there, and both were uh, both were wary of a of a wider war. Yeah, I would uh, would just add to that. I think for the most part, their their interests align, but there's always that push and pull. It's a, a bit of a, a tense relationship at times. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned, the Canadians weren't initially keen to be under British command uh, on, a, on a yet another occasion. Uh, but they're able to work together quite successfully. And I think it's because of years honed of working together during previous conflicts that they're able to, to do so successfully. But it is, I think, a bit of a push and pull relationship at this point because Canada is no longer just the junior partner anymore. Uh, it's looking to establish itself as an independent voice globally. So you can see that in, in the course of the Korean War. Uh, although they do know that they are stronger together, uh, their voices together when it comes to the United States than they would be individually. It's a bit of an irony that if you actually look at the Korean War rearmament uh, program, uh, which, which, which uh, is very pronounced in Canada as in the United States, a lot of this is, uh, is it, it is not only stimulates the emergence of a lot of uh, high tech sectors in the Canadian economy, but it marks uh, something of a drift in defense production procurement in, uh, in, in some think some aspects of, of, of doctrine away from the UK and towards the US. Uh, I mean, Korea marks, uh, well, the, the, the critics argue that, would argue that with Korea, we become uh, an American satellite rather than a British one. I don't endorse that point of view, but I see, I see the underlying logic of the, uh, of the argument. Great. Um, well, it looks like we've, we've uh, the well of questions has run dry. So I will uh, ask if, if any of our panelists have any sort of final remarks they'd like to, to make uh, before we, we sign off for the afternoon. Uh, I would just say thank you very much for the opportunity to present mm -hmm. and uh, for the audience uh, who's here, just uh, spare a thought this weekend uh, for the anniversary of the Battle of Cap Yong and, and give a thought to all the people uh, who served in Korea, be they Canadian, American, uh, uh, Australian, New Zealand, just uh, Amer uh, United Kingdom even. Uh, but uh, yeah, do to keep that anniversary in mind as it is a fairly significant uh, anniversary and milestone that uh, many Korean War veterans may be celebrating or marking for the last time. I would echo that. Yeah, I would echo that. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And hopefully this inspires everyone to, to go out and look at different aspects of Cold War history that perhaps they haven't before. That's right. Um, well, thank you so much to Dr. Jack Cunningham, uh, Dr. Andrew Birch, Dr. Megan Fitzpatrick, uh, our three uh, wonderful panelists. Thanks to my colleagues in the Canada Institute in the History and Public Policy Program and the Asia Program at the Wilson Center. And thank you to our audience for taking the time to join us today uh, for this very insightful and wide ranging conversation about Canada's experience of the Korean War. I hope uh, all of you will come back for more Wilson Center programs uh, and thank you again. <laughs>